I'm going to introduce the facilitator for today's meeting uh, on behalf of the Mainland Council and our communities and civic clubs here in Southern California. Uh, mahalo for coming. This is a great turnout. We've had several meetings over the last few weeks and this is absolutely wonderful. Um, if we fall asleep at the bike, it's because we just drove in from Vegas. Oh. Anyway, my name is Sharon. It's Sharon Kuipopalo. I'm the president of the Hawaiian Interclub Council known as HICC and also the Civic Club Kahai Kapano Kaliponi. Today's facilitator is Lono Kohlers. Lono is the first VP for our Civic Club. Um, he's also the janitor. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he calls himself, our janitor, because he does everything. So anyway, I'm going to turn the mic over to him, but I just want to mahalo um, everyone for com coming and introduce Lono to you, and then he will facilitate today's meeting. We are expecting um, Ray Sa from the Department of the Interior. Uh, we have some very special people in the audience that Lono is going to acknowledge, and then we will move forward with the agenda, and Lono will introduce our speakers. So mahalo for coming. Did you guys see that? <laughs> That's what happens when you're the janitor. Um, first of all, you folks know why we're here. This is a very important meeting. We have oh. an opportunity that uh, presents itself, and it presented itself very quickly. So we had to throw together a whole bunch of meetings just to inform the community. And um, one of the people who stepped up, well, there's many people who stepped up. Kavayo Pua, alo for making lays. And um, the Ahahui, who may also made Leilai. Uh, Uncle Gil, whose uh, place we're in right now. Many, many people stepped up. So. I'm going to let Uncle Gil come up and do his introductory remarks, welcoming remarks, and um, then we'll take it from there and we'll get started, okay? I've got to take either one. I've got to take my shoes off because I noticed Lono and others are running around barefoot. <laughs> uh, aloha avake everybody of our Kilipaka. Um, my name is Gil on time, the campus director here. And it's like being home, which is like family over here. I don't really have Hawaiians coming here. This is the biggest class of Hawaiians I've ever had on the campus. <laughs> Mahalo for coming. Uh, don't leave till you get a degree. Because <laughs> we're going to need it to start this movement. But welcome, I'm very honored that you're all here, and I think this is gonna be a very, very important meeting. So mahalo and Uh Another hand, please, a welcome for <laughs> Uncle Gil. Okay, so there are many factions that have uh, a stake in what's going on, not to include all of you. Or is it? Does it? Absolutely does. So you need to do something. That's why we're here. You need to inform yourself, learn what you need to learn, make a decision, and answer the DOI questions. This is an opportunity that's never happened in history. What happened to the Hawaiian monarchy is something that has happened many times in different relationships with different countries. But we're in a unique position right now, and the DOI needs, the United States needs an answer from us how we want to create a relationship with the United States. That's almost unprecedented. So how do we proceed? These guys are gonna give you some answers I'm sure you're going to have questions, 
Department of Interior is going to come behind and we're going to have another meeting with them. There are forms out on the, on the table for you to respond. This is not going to be a formal hearing. It's not being recorded. So if you want your testimony to be heard, you have to write it down and send it in. August 19th is the deadline. So there's many different aspects to this. There were many presenters that were going to come because of the big storms back home. Uh, not everybody made it out. So it is what it is. We're going to continue these educational meetings even after 19 August to help our Lahui, to help all of you understand what you need to know. And we want you to make the decision. I don't want to tell you this is what you should do. We just want you to learn and we want you to decide what you want to do, okay? So, when you come up to the mic, if you would like to say something, please state your name. If you represent an organization, state your organization. And everybody else, please be respectful. Everybody has opinion. It might be a different opinion from yours. They're still entitled to that. So, please be respectful, let everybody speak. And um, if you get too long-winded, we had times, but we have plenty of time now because not all our speakers made it to the meeting. So we'll see how it goes. If you get too long-winded, I'll ask you to please shorten it up a little bit. So our first presenter is from representing the uh, Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs is uh, Benton Kelly Ipeng. He is a member of the Honolulu Hawaiian Civic Club and he's going to uh, give a presentation from the Hawaiian Civic Club Association. Benton Peng. My name is Benton Kelly Pang. I am um, a member of the Hawaiian Civic Club Honolulu. Um, I also started in the Civic Club though when I was uh, going to Edison High School here in Southern California. Um, I'm the son of Victor and uh, Jane Pang, and I was a member at that time um, with Ainaho, a California Hawaiian Civic Club. Uh, so my relationship with the Civic Clubs is, is, uh, has been uh, quite long. I now reside in Hawaii. I am a uh, biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, I happened to be in town because I was in training on the East Coast for Fish and Wildlife. And um, as I do all the time, when I go to the East Coast, I stop off in L.A. Um, before I go home to Honolulu. And so I happen to be here for, for a couple of days. I knew about the meeting ahead of time. I was planning to come to the meeting. Um, but um, Azel kind of threw uh, a, a, a threw us in a loop, so to speak, and Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs, I know Amaral um, canceled her flights to come from Honolulu to, to the meetings here on the West Coast and called me to ask if I could um, attend at least the Southern California meeting. I told her I, I could. So the presentation I'm giving is on behalf of the association. It's a presentation that she's given uh, to many of the clubs um, on Oahu, and uh, it's been uh, some of the presentations that have been shared uh, here on the continent as well. Um, so I, I know, sorry she couldn't be here, um, but I hope, hope you understand and, and I hope I, I, I do a, a good job in, in, her, in her shoes. Um, what else I want to say? Um, the Hawaiian Civic Club of Honolulu um, was established in, in 1918. A, a group of uh, Hawaiians at the time, Hawaiian leaders actually, John Wise, um, a, uh, a, a, a Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole, um, a Reverend Akiko Akana met at uh, a young hotel um, downtown and wanted to do something for the Hawaiian people and felt um, what they wanted was something um, to, uh, they, they saw the disparities going on in socioeconomics with the Hawaiians, poor health. Um, they also saw that people, Hawaiians were losing their national identity, their Hawaiian language, 
Um, so they came up with a plan. The, the plan was sort of twofold. One, they would establish the Hawaiian Civil Club of Honolulu, and that was done in 1918. And then Kuhio took that, um, this vision to improve the betterment of Hawaiians and pushed through legislation in 1921 established the uh, D Department of Hawaiian Homelands and the Home Hawaiian Homestead Act. Um, the primary purpose for the Hawaiian Civic Honolulu at that time was to elevate the social and intellectual status of all Hawaiians and to increase pride and race heritage. And so that's sort of the mission of the Hawaiian Civic Honolulu. It was the vision that helped uh, spur on the, the Homestead Act. And from the Hawaiian Civic Honolulu, other civic clubs were established, Prince Kuyo Hawaiian Civic Club, Pearl Harbor Hawaiian Civic Club. And then in um, the 1980s, an association of Hawaiian civic clubs was established. And this would be sort of an umbrella organization over all of the civic clubs, and at that time only in the state of uh, Hawaii. Um, uh, some of the Hawaiians living here on the West Coast, including my, my grand auntie, Marianne Kalama, um, saw a vision to establish the mainland council. What they needed though was, was three clubs. At the time there were only two clubs. There was Aina Hau um, and Liliuokalani. And so a third club was needed to establish a mainland council. And when they did that, they were able to establish the mainland council and we've grown since then. Um, there now are about 58 Hawaiian civic clubs, not just again in the state of Hawaii, but also encompassing Alaska, California, Colorado, Illinois, Utah, Virginia, Washington State, Tennessee, and Texas. So Hawaiians get around quite a bit. And they are um, still working with, with Kuhio's vision to better um, the social and economic status of all Native Hawaiians. So that's, I just wanted to provide that introduction. Some of you may not know that history, especially for civic club members from here, you may not know the history uh, of this, how the civic clubs came to be. Um, so I wanted to provide that um, at, on the outset. Um, the association has since 2000, um, when the issue was first introduced, um, to support the various forms of the Native Hawaiian Reorganization Act, also known as the Akaka Bill, and this included federal recognition. Um, individual clubs may have differing views, but the association um, has passed resolutions um, at its various conventions supporting federal recognition. So that's the basis of this particular presentation. So why, um, first, first, first slide here, um, why speak with the Department of Interior about the advance notice uh, proposed rulemaking? The establishment of a government to government relationship with the Native Hawaiian government is the most viable action that can be taken to protect and expand exi existing trust assets, federal programmatic funding, federal consultation rights, and other, <coughs> excuse me, and other self-determination rights under federal law. Um, we should not be denied the basic self-governance rights afforded to all other major indigenous groups in the United States. In 1993, Public Law 103-150, also known as the Apology Resolution, um, Congress called upon the U.S. and the executive branch to reconcile with Native Hawaiian people. So this advance notice, a proposed rulemaking by the Department of Interior is a significant first step. The process to create a path for federal recognition of a government-to-government -government relationship with Native Hawaiians is embedded in this proposed rulemaking. It's just to help create a path. The process is to recognize, a, the process um, is to recognize a Native Hawaiian government, not to create a government, okay, so there's a difference. It's to recognize a Native Hawaiian government, not to create a Native Hawaiian government. Creating the government is going to be responsibility of Native Hawaiians, most of who, most who have enrolled in a, uh, the Native Hawaiian world, or kana'i olovalu. It doesn't matter if you support independence or nation within a nation, whatever government is created must still be recognized by the federal government. So the question before us is, do we want the Department of Interior to create a path towards that recognition. The Native Hawaiian Sovereignty Movement started in 1972. 
when uh, Louisa Rice created the movement called ALOHA, which is the acronym for Aboriginal Lands of Hawaiian Ancestry, and this organization sought reparations from Congress. 1974, Ohana o Hawaii, founded by Peggy Howell Ross, declared the restored constitutional Hawaiian kingdom and sought redress in The Hague. In 1984, saw the first sovereignty conference at Kamehameha Schools, and this was sponsored by Na'uivi o Hawaii. 1987, Kalahui Hawaii, founded by Mililani Trask, Benenkeo Kaha Hawaii, and drafted a constitution with 250 delegates. 1991, Hui Na'o a coalition of 50 or more Native Hawaiian groups met to create a sovereignty educational program, created materials, and went statewide with their educational efforts for three years. They received approximately a million dollars from the U.S. Administration for Native Americans. The Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs um, passed resolutions to support this educational effort. In 1993, the state legislature established the Hawaiian Sovereignty Election Advisory Commission, which created the Native Hawaiian vote. The question was, shall the Hawaiian people elect delegates to propose a Native Hawaiian form of government? The Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs also supported this effort. 1999, the delegates met in convention, but failed to pass a governing document. From 2000 to 2011, Senator Akaka introduced nine bills to create a federal recognition for Native Hawaiians. All these efforts failed in Congress. The Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs, again, passed resolutions supporting um, uh, federal recognition through those efforts of Senator Kaka. This effort, we feel, is the last effort to gain federal recognition of a government-to-government -government relationship with Native Hawaiians, and we must support it. We must join together, um, and after we receive um, uh, this, this rule change, we must all then join together and create a government um, for the feds to recognize. So um, continuing on with uh, Kalahui's efforts in the late 80s and then um, the nine bills which died in Congress of, of Senator Akaka. Um, currently there are more than 150 laws and millions of dollars in federal funds which go specifically to Native Hawaiians. So right now, Hawaiians are recognized by the federal government politically under these particular federal programs. But what we don't have is we don't have a government advocating for us to the federal government. So this real change will help in that process. And some of the um, uh, major programs are the Native Hawaiian Education Act, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, of course, and the Native Hawaiian Health Care Act. Some of the um, other federal agencies that currently support Native Hawaiians include uh, these or, uh, agencies uh, listed here. These are all federal agencies. And um, this has resulted in many programs benefiting Native Hawaiians. Um, one particular uh, example is Likua'e. They receive a million dollars in federal funds for, for college scholarships. This is a program funded under the Native Hawaiian um, Education Act. The Na uh, Native Hawaiian Health Care Act, um, millions of dollars goes to Papa Ololokahi, which oversees a number of Native Hawaiian health care systems in the state. They receive about $40 million a year for health care um, and education. But other, other federal programs help to protect uh, historic sites, cultural practices, um, and it's, it's this particular funding of these programs uh, which have been decreasing and which are um, un under threat by um, some, in, some in Congress. Again, because Hawaiians are recognized uh, politically, they don't have a, a government to government relationship, some feel that the special funding for Hawaiian programs, Native Hawaiian Health Care Act, uh, Native Hawaiian Education Act, um, are targeted for a particular race of people. And so under the 14th <laughs> Amendment, Equal Protection Clause, 
some in Congress, mainly on, on the Republican and Tea Party side, see that as being unconstitutional. So these federal programs may, may, um, may be done away with. They've been, uh, been decreased in funding over the years, um, but they may be done away with. So this um, federal recognition will help, help to preserve some of that federal funding. Um, the Department of Interior uh, held, it came out with a press release um, back in um, uh, early uh, June, or I think maybe late June. Um, they established public hearings from late June to early July in Hawaii and decided to hold some um, consultation uh, meetings uh, here in Indian country. In addition, what was great is that people like Lono and folks from the civic clubs urged the Department of Interior to hold additional meetings, holding meetings and where they had already set up in Connecticut, Minnesota, um, Washington, and Arizona, didn't reach the tens of thousands of Hawaiians who reside um, in California and Nevada. Um, so uh, through Lono's efforts and others, it was good that they were able to invite Department of Interior to come to additional meetings. Uh, last night's meeting in San Francisco was one, and uh, tonight's meeting is the other. Um, now, all of the official meetings that were in the press release have, have been completed. Um, so right now, our meeting tonight is probably one of the last meetings um, with the Department of Interior. Um, after, after August 19th, when the deadline for all comments um, ar um, arrives, the Department of Interior will take all those comments and review them and they will decide where they feel the Hawaiian community is at on, on, um, on, this, on these rules, should the Department of Interior establish these rules or not. <coughs> if they decide not to establish the rules, um, then the Department of Interior takes no action, rulemaking is not pursued, pow. So status quo, nothing's changed. If they do decide to go ahead with proposing rules. They will make those rules public. They will publish them in the Federal Register and they will have additional meetings and seek public input again. And um, so we would go through this um, sort of process again if once they come out with those rules, if, if they decide to go ahead with the rulemaking. So again, if they decide to go ahead with, with the rulemaking, There'll be a notice of hearing. There'll be opportunity for public comment. There'll be additional agency review. Then the final rule will be published in the Federal Register. And then the rules would then be applied by federal departments, um, including the State Department, all, this, all the government um, in the executive branch. So there were, in the Federal Register, there are 19 questions that are being asked for public comment. When the Department of Interior, and I happened to go on um, many of the, probably at least 12 of the meetings um, in, um, in Hawaii um, with the Department of Interior and Department of Justice representatives, and um, they came out with a, a handout. It's on the first uh, round table out there of uh, five basic questions, and, uh, but there are actually 19 total questions. Um, the first, if, if the answer to the first question is no, then you don't have to answer any of the other questions. You, if your answer to the first question is yes, then it, the interior is asking for you know, further input on, um, on what type of assistance can the Department of Interior provide? Um, how sh should um, they recognize that this is of the people and this was a democratic process? So um, I encourage you to read through those 19 questions, uh, again, if, if you're in support of this, and see if you can provide input. Look at those 19 questions. But the top five is what um, the association has been focusing its um, uh, members on. So the first question is again, should the secretary propose an administrative rule that would facilitate the reestablishment of a government to government relationship with the native Hawaiian community? Again, yes, then go on, answer the other questions. If no, then there's, um, you don't need to answer the other questions. Should the Secretary assist the Native Hawaiian community in recognizing its government with which the United States could reestablish a government-to-government -government relationship? So should the Department of Interior assist um, the Native Hawaiian community in 
reorganizing its government. The third question, what process should be established for drafting and ratifying um, the Native Hawaiian government's constitution or other governing document? So how does the, how does the federal government know that this has been done by the people and was voted upon by the people. For the fourth question um, actually addresses some of the efforts going on currently in the state of Hawaii. Um, there's the Native Hawaiian roll called Kanaiola Valo, which is being uh, done right now. Um, some of you may have signed up. Um, that is sort of a, a, a state process and it so this fourth question is saying that should the secretary rely upon a, a, a process facilitated by the state of Hawaii, but that is also consistent with, with federal law. So that's sort of what, what question four gets to. So if you would like them to use a, a state-run process such as Kanat Yolvalu, um, then, then you say yes to four, and you might want to provide examples of, of why. If you don't want, the state to run it, um, and you don't, you know, uh, like Kanat Yovalu and, and the way they've done things, then, then you may say no in this question and then provide an, an alternative. What else can be done to enroll people, have them um, declare their Aboriginal blood, have that certified by independent organization, and have those people elect delegates, and those delegates then meet in, in for a constitutional convention. That's essentially what Kanayo Lovalu is. It's, it's, a, it's a role. People sign up. They have to um, make sure they verify their, their Hawaiian blood is verified by independent organization. They, they'll soon vote delegates to a constitutional convention, and at that constitutional convention, some type of governing document will come out of it. The fifth question. Um, what conditions should the secretary establish as prerequisites? prerequisites? Um, for federal acknowledment of a government gov gov to government relationship with an organized um, Native Hawaiian government. So it should be there, there be prerequisites that the, that the federal government um, establishes before they accept some type of um, governing document from, from the state of Hawaii, okay? Again, the public comment period is still open right now. You have till August 19th, so it's about nine, nine more days. Um, like Lona said, I think being informed of the process, you coming here tonight is, is a great first step. Um, some of you may have heard about this going on already, and so you may, may have wanted to have um, some of your questions answered um, by the panelists uh, here tonight. Some of you may have heard of it for the first time, so you're taking advantage of this opportunity to, to learn. Um, we have handouts, you'll hear presentations, talk, talk to your ohana, um, and then um, put your ideas in writing if you can, and then submit it to the Department of Interior. Um, the Federal Register publication um, has the, the address. Um, there are handouts out there also that ha is, a, is actually a public comment forum that you can use, has the address that you can send your uh, comments via snail mail or electronically. Um, a lot of this, um, because this, this was uh, done um, a, a month or so ago, a lot of this doesn't apply. The first bullet doesn't necessarily apply because there's no more public hearings um, per se. Um, but you can still submit your written testimony. Again, you could do it either by online or you could uh, mail it in. And that's the end of my presentation. Mahalo.